My name is Jan Harzan. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings. MUFON is really more just left of center, where we try to take a scientific approach by collecting the data first off, and then reviewing the data, investigating the data, and making sure that what we're seeing is actually something that's truly an unknown. We have 3,000 members worldwide. Many scientists, physicists, PhDs, metallurgists, biologists, all the way down to just the average citizen who really wants to get involved. Some of those have chosen to become field investigators, and they go through our field investigative training courses. They become part of the team in their state or country where they reside, and they actually get engaged in going out and meeting this phenomena head on. We receive about 500 to 1,000 reports per month from around the world. Field investigators will take the case, generally review it, uh, try to come up with a hypothesis, checking star charts, and we'll go put an investigation in place to determine what exactly happened. We've recently formed a science review board, and that board is made up of scientists from around the United States and around the world to review some of our more significant cases and try to render an opinion on them. What we'd like to do is be more outbound, more outspoken in terms of the really true UFO cases. So MUFON is moving forward with this approach and we'll be publishing papers in these different areas to allow the general public and even the scientific community to be able to be challenged by what we're finding. That's the strength of MUFON as an organization is being really the truth seekers of the UFO field. there are few women on this planet as courageous and as dedicated as Linda. We are really honored to have Linda present on Go Beckley Tepe. So please give a warm welcome to Linda Moulton Howe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to thank Jan Harzan, my dear, dear friend Jennifer Stein, Bob Wood, who I have known, it seems, for decades in this search, and all of MUFON for persisting in these important efforts to go beyond the politically controlled and government policies of denial about what seem like simple words, UFOs and ETs, but behind those acronyms are 16 layered chess games. As a longtime TV producer and investigative journalist, I also want to thank you, a wonderful audience, for being here because I think that you are part of a growing population around the world that not only think that we humans are not alone in the universe, but that other intelligences have been interacting with Earth for centuries. No matter what policies of denial, government and power centers have used to keep the public and the media ignorant on purpose. In fact, on July 15th, a few days ago, a NASA panel on the search for life in the universe gathered in Washington, D.C., where NASA Administrator Charles Bolden said that he is, quote, probably convinced that it is highly improbable in the limitless vastness of the universe that we humans stand alone, close quote. Further, MIT physicist Sarah Seeger said, quote, we believe that we are very, very close in terms of technology and science, 
to actually finding another earth and signs of life on another world, close quote. My own personal opinion is that this government has a policy that they would like to announce that we are not alone in this universe from a safe distance on Mars or Europa or Enceladus or another planet before they let everybody know that we're just the latest life form standing up primate on this planet and that a lot has been going on here for millions of years. And to that point, I think that these circles in stone and dirt found around this planet going back at least 15,000 years in South Africa are residues of other intelligent life in the cosmos interacting with and terraforming Earth. These ancient South African stone circles only can be seen from the air. This is very important to remember because they are dated to at least 15,000 years ago. Michael Tellinger thinks they could be as old as 250,000 years. Their location is west of Maputo and north of Swaziland, going forward in time from South Africa's stone circles to 12,000 years ago, we come to the mysterious circles of tall limestone pillars in Gobekli Tepe in southern Turkey. Jumping to India, this is a 10,000-year-old rock painting of a hairless being with large black eyes, four fingers, and four toes. This extraordinary gray extraterrestrial-looking being was recently found in the Charama, India region, 1,100 miles inland and northwest of Mumbai. Indian archaeologist J.R. Bhagat told the Times of India on July 15, 2014, only five days ago, quote, these rock paintings are done in natural colors that have hardly faded despite the years. Findings suggest that humans in prehistoric times may have seen or imagined beings from other planets. Close quote. The Times of India points out that people in the villages of Chandeli and Gotitola, where the cave rock paintings have been found and photographed, talk about how their ancestors, the Rohila people, Rohila translates as, quote, the small-sized ones, close quote. The villagers describe the Rohila as landing from the sky in a round-shaped flying object and taking away one or two villagers who have never returned. I was reminded by those 10,000-year-old yellow garments and large rounded heads of a modern-day large-headed gray-skinned being encountered during a November 1980 abduction from Longmont, Colorado. A husband and wife were uh, taken in a blue beam of light from a highway that was right near Longmont. They were taken into a craft. The craft landed and the husband and the wife were able to see what was a being with a round-shaped head at a doorway wearing some sort of a cape, and this gold-yellowed, strangely layered collared being is who dealt with them and did examinations. These beings had four long fingers on each hand. And about the rock painting, Professor Begat said, quote, that here we are looking at the fan-like antenna and three legs of a vehicle clearly showing a similarity to UFO-type craft, close quote. Professor Bagat is in the Chattagar State Department of Archaeology and Culture, and he is formally asking NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization, known as ISRO, to help research these recently discovered rock paintings that date back 10,000 years ago, and keeping in mind this is 10,000 and painted in red, this is what the husband in Colorado drew of a November 1980 modern encounter in which there are legs supporting a ring and a round disc 
in the forest. Now, that was 10,000 years ago that those paintings were done. 9,000 years ago, also only visible from the air for unknown reasons, thousands of complicated circular patterns were constructed in the ancient black rock of huge Harat Asharan lava field that extends into the lands of modern Jordan, north into Syria, and south into Saudi Arabia. For those of you who hear me on Coast to Coast AM radio every month and Dreamland online every month and go to my news website, earthfiles.com, you would have heard an interview that I did with the scientist who broke the ground on these strange circles and rings that had been found in Syria, Saudi Arabia, and that Middle Eastern area where even the Bedouin, who have been there as long as they say the land has been, they never knew until the satellite research of the Australian scientist that any of these rings were there in that lava land. These are east of Amman in Jordan, and like all the others, can only be seen from the air. But the reason for their creation is unknown, and the scientist who is now trying to do more work from Google says that he hopes in another year or two that they will be able to show how extensive these rings and circles and patterns are in that part of the world from using the satellite, where they cannot go because of political warfare. 2,000 years ago, a standing, or 7,000 years ago, a standing stone circle was erected at Napta in the Nubian Saharan Desert in Egypt. Here, researchers have discovered six megalithic standing stones at the center of a circle made of 24 more stones. Like the spokes of a wheel, Alignments radiate outward in what is thought to be an astronomical calculator, reminiscent of the great circle of Stonehenge in England that emerged 2,000 years later than this one in Napta. Stonehenge itself is about 5,000 years old, it is described by some as a Neolithic stone computer. Astronomer Gerald Hawkins, author of Stonehenge Decoded, detailed analysis that showed this stone computer accurately computed many different cycles of solar and lunar eclipses for a period of 300 years before a very simple adjustment was needed for another 300 years of detailed eclipse accuracy. Further, modern day research demonstrates that Stonehenge resonates, quote, much like blowing over the top of a bottle to make it whistle, or like running a finger around the top of a crystal glass. This would work by making the air in the space vibrate at its fundamental resonant frequency. Measurements of the diameter of Stonehenge indicate that its fundamental resonant frequency is about 10 hertz, close quote. 10 hertz raises this question. Why so well matched to a frequency that is an alpha wave pattern in the human brain? Alpha waves are associated with relaxation, altered states of consciousness and meditation. So why was Stonehenge constructed specifically to resonate at 10 Hertz, in addition to its work as a stone astronomical computer? From Stonehenge to South Africa to Gobekli Tepe to the Middle East to Egypt and beyond. What if stone circles for centuries have been deliberately designed to resonate in specific frequencies as machines that operate by self-activating software turned on in certain fields? Who made the stone machines and the self-activating software? One hypothesis is that non-humans from somewhere else in the cosmos have been terraforming this planet Earth for millennia. There are about 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies in this universe. 
Perhaps half of them have planets. NASA's Kepler mission has discovered dozens of planets that are in that Goldilocks zone of not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, just light, just right to sustain life. And for me, since 1979, I have been exposed in my work as a TV producer, writer, director, editor, and reporter to Earth mysteries and whistleblowers that indicate other cosmic intelligences have interacted with Earth for what they say could be as much as 270 million years and continue to interact today. One of those TV productions took me to Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico on April 9, 1983. I was working on a home box office documentary entitled UFOs, the ET Factor. Then New York attorney Peter Gerson, who was working with Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, had organized a meeting for me at the U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. There, Special Agent Richard Doty handed me an alleged briefing paper for, quote, the President of the United States of America on the subject of unidentified aerial craft known as UACs that included this information. Quote, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. Was the first ET genetic manipulation all the way back to Homo erectus in Africa 1.9 million years ago. Or, in one of the later models, leading up to Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien on the far right of this graphic, and that is modern humanity, all of you sitting in this room. 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, this latest model of standing up primate, Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, had three big improvements over the preceding Neanderthalensis. Homo sapien sapien has a brain that has changed for language. The cro could build boats, and they could make more sophisticated stone tools. So if the briefing paper that I was shown at Kirtland Air Force Base was correct, ETs made different models of Homo sapien from already evolving primates and kept tweaking different models up to modern humankind. The implication is that those DNA manipulating intelligences have been based on Earth for millions of years, harvesting and manipulating genetic material from Earth with non-terrestrial technologies that include anti-gravity, invisibility, and projection of three-dimensional holograms as camouflage. That's very important. Three-dimensional holograms as camouflage. And I will be dis discussing all of this in a few minutes. But let's go back to the last big ice age. This reached about its peak about 18,000 years ago, and the ice was coming down in these areas of the Northern Hemisphere, but you can see the Mediterranean was clear, cool, and dry, and so was this part of Southern Canada and the United States. During that warming, after reaching that 18,000 year peak, it began to warm up very rapidly, and sometime, around 11,000 to 12,000 years ago, when it should have kept on warming, the temperatures of the Earth plunged very rapidly, as much as 30 degrees Fahrenheit below present-day temperature. That is called the Younger Dryas cold snap that lasted 1,500 years. Scientists have discovered in parts of North America a layer of nanodiamonds and iridium. And iridium is a material that is linked to impacts coming in from outer space. The hypothesis is that one or more comets and or meteors collided with this planet 
on the North American side and cause fires and dark skies around the entire Earth for at least five years, and that is the black mat in the previous photo. This is what is called the Younger Dryas black mat. It covers, in many areas, hundreds of square miles. In that darkness, 33 large animal species went extinct in North America, including the woolly mammoths excavated from tundra still preserved with buttercups in their mouths. That means that those big animals were quick frozen. Saber-toothed tigers in their skeletons have been found with their spines twisted 180 degrees by some unimaginable force. At the same time, all of this chaos was happening in North America. On the other side of the world is a place called Gobekli Tepe, nine miles northeast of San Lurfa, Turkey, near the Syrian northern border. Here is a satellite map. Here is where Gobekli Tepe is. Down here is San Lurfa, a museum that I'll be talking about. And this is a region that for centuries, the water supply is the ancient Euphrates River, the longest river in Western Asia. These circles of limestone pillars have been carbon dated to 12,000 years ago, and that is more than twice the age of Mesopotamia. miles away from the crowded streets of Istanbul, Ishanlurfa, in southeastern Turkey. There, in 1994, on a dusty hilltop, a local shepherd noticed the tip of a stone sticking out of his field. He began to dig, eventually unearthing a 19-foot pillar. Its edges were precise, and rising from its center was a relief carving of a strange animal. Upon closer examination, it appeared that the finely chiseled stone had been fashioned by talented stonemasons working with advanced tools. Curiously, after 13 years of digging, archaeologists investigating the ancient site have failed to recover a single stone-cutting tool, nor have they found any agricultural implements. How in the world can you contemplate 19-foot tall, perfectly sculpted columns that are 11 to 12,000 years old and no tools? When word of the discovery reached the scientific community, one fact became obvious. A Kurdish shepherd had stumbled upon what is perhaps the most astonishing archaeological discovery in modern times, a site known as Gobekli Tepe. For 13 years, a German archaeology team has been meticulously going into a hill, and they have been doing carbon dating as deep as they go has taken them 13 years to uncover only 5% of a gigantic civilization. They know what's under the ground. Circles upon circles upon circles, perfect circles in stone. And rising up out of those stone circles are huge sculpted columns, 19 feet high, 15 tons per column. Yeah, I need Test it. results have supported the idea that Gobekli Tepe is nearly 12,000 years old, almost 7,000 years older than Mesopotamia's Fertile Crescent, long heralded as the cradle of civilization. In Gobekli Tepe, the oldest advanced site now on our planet, we know of no other site that is this advanced. 
it is now double the history of humanity. And right there is this gigantic site with huge megalithic circular structures. It just stands there, a mystery, asking us to go figure, how was this done? What's the background to this? No. We don't know who made them. They just come out of the darkness of the last ice age, where we know nothing, and enter the stage of history already fully formed. And to my mind, this is indicative of a major forgotten episode in human history. Could the discovery of Gobekli Tepe radically change our understanding of human history? And might proof of an ancient civilization provide evidence that mankind's most puzzling myths might actually be based in fact? A lot of myths, a lot of legends suggest that there were past civilizations of astounding sophistication at incredibly early periods. I think we have little glimmers, little suggestions around the world that there was something going on much higher, much more sophisticated, at a much earlier period of time. Gobekli Tepe means Potbelly Hill, and it was the hill's unnatural shape that first caught the attention of University of Chicago and Istanbul University in the 1960s. And they thought this hill should be investigated, and it took a long time before Dr. Klaus Schmidt from Germany repeatedly was able to come and start digging into this hill. And as he began to find what was under there and was doing meticulous carbon dating wherever they could find carbon, it kept coming back 12,000 years. It took him until 2010 to tell the world, and he knew then that archaeologists everywhere were going to rise up and say, this is impossible. But now, today, in 2014, there is no question, this is a 12,000-year-old structure. But adding to the mystery of the 12,000-year-old, very sophisticated construction, is that so far, Dr. Schmidt has found no evidence that people permanently resided here. There are no tools, there are no cooking utensils, there's nothing except these incredibly heavy and strange and elegant pillars in rings and material that I'm going to show you that I think will be startling that they've taken out of around these rings to the museum. So what was Gobekli Tepe's purpose? Ground-penetrating radar indicates that there might be at least 250 more standing pillars formed in 18 circles still buried under acres of deep soil. Dr. Schmidt has, it has also discovered that all 30 acres of the pillars in circles were strangely reburied a thousand years after this was built. Did the original Gobekli creators have foreknowledge about the coming impact from outer space? Did someone with advanced technology rapidly rebury all of the pillars over 30 acres because Gobekli Tepe was a valuable alien machine? I wanted to see and feel Gobekli Tepe up close for myself. So I joined a tour led by Boston University geologist Robert Schock, PhD. And on Wednesday, June 13th, 2012, as the sun rose, I was standing on the Gobekli Tepe hilltop in southern Turkey. Ramps have been built to walk around the circles of mysterious limestone pillars. The hilltop is a thousand feet above the valley floor. The limestone slabs were quarried from bedrock pits located only about 350 feet from the hill, but each one of these limestone pillars that average 19 feet weigh tons. And as that sun rose on the eastern horizon on June 13th, I first faced the sun directly on purpose because I wanted to know what would happen 
if I just turn my body 180 degrees, what will I see down below in the pillars? Would I see anything that seemed to be standing out with a little bit more light? And what I saw was where the pink is here, and in another one I'll show you in a moment, and this is what that pillar is. There is a very odd animal here, but take a look at this. This has been excavated, and yet, as many people who have been there said, it looks like a modern sculpture in which some sort of cement matrix has been used on the bottom to hold it. But when you see the next one, you're going to see that there is a groove. This whole thing was manufactured to be put together like Legos. This is a creature that no one knows in the modern world today exactly what it is. And throughout the archaeology of Klaus Schmidt, one of the overriding discoveries is that there are literally dozens of different types of creatures that are either three-dimensionally coming out in sculptures or carved into these stones, and no one knows what they are. Now here is where I was looking down into this side, and there was also a reflection. And here is this famous pillar that has, maybe this is something like a fox, nobody is exactly sure, but coming down are these long arms that come to fingers that are clasped here. This is a belt, and the symbols in this belt have been studied by many different uh, linguists, and they cannot find anything in any of the languages that matches what is around this belt. Now, what might be hanging from this belt has been described by archaeologists as perhaps a fox, unknown, but some sort of an animal pelt is hanging from this belt that has these indecipherable symbols. And along the base, this was a dramatic picture that was taken by Smithsonian Magazine, and the reporter, by the way, echoed my own thoughts. He said when he was one of the first in there in 2010, and the Smithsonian reporter said that there was something so alien about this site that it made him wonder about other beings in the universe. Along the base of this are also unrecognizable unless they are something like the extinct Dodo bird, no one understands, but this is what Turkey's June 2012 issue of Actual Archaeology reported about this particular belt and arms, quote. On the belt, a loincloth depicted in relief cut out of the stone is hanging down, covering the genital region. Due to the existence not only of arms and human hands, but also of belts and loincloths on the central pillars of Enclosure D, it can be clearly stated that the T-shaped pillars have an anthropomorphic identity. But who are they? As their faces are never depicted, they seem very likely to be related to supernatural beings, beings gathered at Gobekli Tepe for certain but so far unknown purposes, close quote, actual archaeology Turkey. As I was standing there wondering about extraterrestrial beings having constructed the Gobekli Tepe pillars in circles all over the hilltop, Yale University trained geologist Robert Schock, PhD, joined me. He said to me, quote, you know, there is something about the shape of these limestone pillars that makes me think of tuning forks. I wonder if this whole place was made to vibrate, to resonate with some frequency provoked by a field from technology above, close quote. Strange carvings on the Gobekli Tepe pillars include a wild boar, a bird with a sphere above a scorpion, 
a three-dimensional cat-like figure with a long tail is sculpted on this pillar. This is not glued on. This whole pillar was made as one sculpted piece with this animal projecting out from it in 3D. No hunter-gatherers scraping with flint arrowheads made this. Stressing the fact that the creature's symbols in humanoids found in the Gobekli Tepe excavation came long before later cultures in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Mediterranean, the layers of symbols on one of the Gobekli pillars is especially puzzling in its meaning. This Gobekli Tepe bird, right here, looks a lot like this Egyptian bird. It has a disc. This is 12,000 years old. This is 2,000 years old. There's 10,000 years of a timeline between these two images on this planet. In the circle here, it's missing the tangent, but this was known as the Shen in Egypt. And this was known as the vulture that was Nekbet. And Nekbet and this particular disc with the tangent comes from an Egyptian word that means to encircle. So perhaps the Gobekli Tepe bird-like figure holding a disc is the source for much later Egyptian, Minoan, and Mesopotamian birds with outstretched wings, that this came first, that this is the antecedent, the source of what was being used in Egypt 10,000 years later. And in Egypt, this Shen is a symbol for eternity, infinity, and protection which is why it has long been evolved as a cartouche to surround the names to protect them for all time, and the Shen was applied to the rulers to protect them through eternity. That is the purpose. That is the purpose of the disk. And in the Egypt, the tangent was asking to perpetuate the life force into eternity. Now we were shocked to learn that on one of the nights, only one week before we got there, that a statue that they had found was removed, was stolen in the night where there were no guards on this hill. There was no money for any kind of security and they had been working there for 14 years at that time and they had, uh, had been moving the most valuable things that they found to a museum, but theft had already begun to creep in. So we went down to the San Lurfa, or Urfa Museum, to see what had been taken. Out of that hill already, only 5% excavated among those pillars. Inside the museum, were clusters of these stone creatures, including this odd standing up, almost like you would say a humanoid boar with a tusk, but with very strange body markings. And these surrounded this eerie stone totem, and I'm showing you exactly as I approached. I have always had a kind of rule for myself when I am going someplace and I want to document as I go. I want to document everything as I discover it with fresh eyes. So as I came into this room, I took this photograph and I'm standing to the left and I think these must be snakes. I think that would be a fair assessment. Head and a snake body. I had no idea what this was. It stands approximately six foot three inches high, carved in stone. Now, when I went around to the front, this is exactly the same shock I had that you will have. 
Now the face is obliterated in the front, but it comes down to a body here. And what you realize is that the snakes on the side are the knees and the odd legs of whatever this was. The face here has also been obliterated. And in Gobekli Tepe, where they have found various objects that might be humanoid, for reasons unknown, the faces are often erased. They've been erased here and here, but these legs on the side that look like snakes and now here's a third body. And what is the third body doing? The fingers are coming around like the pillars. And what looks like a human infant is coming out of a pubis. About this, Turkey's June 2012 issue of actual archaeology reports, quote, one of the biggest surprises at Gobekli Tepe was a large six foot four inch sculpture reminiscent of the totem poles of North American natives, which was discovered in 2009 and excavated in 2010. The sculpture had been set into the northeastern wall of a rectangular room and this totem was not visible originally due to the wall completely covering it. This was completely hidden. The uppermost head depicts a predator, close quote, actual archaeology. But what kind of predator was on top of this totem that depicts what looks like a human childbirth? Here is another strange head of a sophisticated 12,000-year-old statue called Urfa Man. He is hairless, and what must have been a huge nose is broken off the face. But it is those protruding black crystal obsidian eyes that grab you so you cannot turn away. And then you realize he never had a mouth. That line, that chin, they were molded with a depression as if sealing the Urfa man in silence or telepathic thoughts forever. And then your eyes drop down to the neck and the chest where there is a double V neck on what appears to be a leotard uniform like the TV series Star Trek. But this Urfa man statue is in the layers that are 12,000 years old. Why is it wearing a double V neck like Star Trek? The Urfa man's hands are holding what appears to be an erect phallus with the testicles hanging down below the hands. The hands have five fingers out front. Many of us stood there and some people said, are there thumbs behind the erect phallus? If so, is this a six-fingered statue? Strangely, the legs are not depicted. Instead, there is only the stump that would be pushed into the soil in and around the pillar rings up on the hill. Urfa man would stand silent with its black crystal eyes and no mouth among those tall pillars. So who was making Urfa man and the bizarre stone totem 12,000 years ago? Who or what beyond humans has inspired construction of stone circles and pillars, pyramids and ziggurats for millennia? Who watches Earth? Who manipulates genes in evolving life forms? Who monitors the evolutions? And then who harvests the genetic material? Who or what leaves humans dumbfounded by displays of glowing lights, and silent aerial craft in the skies? What if the builders of Gobekli Tepe, Atlantis, the Sphinx, Stonehenge, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, the Incas and Mayans were all from non-human civilizations? What if those advanced intelligences have been interacting with Earth for millions of years the way we seed and harvest crops? That non-human terraforming and genetic harvest of Earth life 
continues today, and I first reported evidence of that 33-some years ago in May 1980, when my TV documentary, A Strange Harvest, was first broadcast on the CBS station in Denver, Colorado. I was director of special projects there, and the subject was my investigation of animal mutilations in Colorado and North America. Ranchers, sheriffs, and deputies had told me, usually only off the record, that the mutilations were caused by, quote, creatures from outer space, close quote. I can remember how I felt the first time a sheriff looked in my eyes and said, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators are creatures from outer space, Sheriff Tex Graves, Logan County, Colorado. And I was stunned. And in many ways, I'm still stunned standing at this podium. But it took me on a nine-month journey, 18 hours a day, without let-up, to produce a strange harvest. One horse farmer saw a silver disc in his pasture when he had a series of colt mutilations on his Missouri farm in 1975. The disc in his pasture left behind a circle of dead grass and ceramic hard soil that remained for two years afterwards. The horse farmer also saw this small glowing being in his truck headlights when he was driving home one night during the horse mutilations. Law enforcement told me that when fiery red-orange spheres of light showed up, animal mutilations followed. Some ranchers have even described seeing beams of light either raise an animal into a glowing craft or lower an animal to the ground that they find then dead and mutilated, no blood, no tracks. But what instrument is used to excise tissue in such neat bloodless ovals and circles like the removed penis in the clean white hair of this bull calf in Manila, Utah, found October 22, 1982. What instrument made the bloodless serrated edges on this Great Falls, Montana cow in 1975 or the Portland, Oregon steer in 1990? It began to dawn on me that the worldwide perpetrators of animal mutilations for at least a century or more could be unmanned drones and androids transporting self-activating machines that can surgically collect tissues without blood like the perfect half-utter excise from this pregnant cow in Colorado Springs. This happened between noon and 5 p.m. on September 9, 1982. The owners were outside the entire day, one quarter of a mile from this pasture. They never heard or saw anything unusual until they found this dead and mutilated pregnant cow, not a drop of blood. The concept of self-activating machines programmed by very advanced non-human intelligences to neutralize gravity, render invisibility, and project holograms came into sharper focus by May 2007. That's when a series of photographs of dragonfly-shaped, highly strange aerial craft began to emerge, beginning with this one taken on May 5, 2007 in Lake Tahoe, California, and it was by a MUFON member who anonymously emailed this image. And then the images began to be sent to earthfiles.com, my news website, and to Coast to Coast AM. The next day, on May 6, 2007, this series of photos were taken by a man who called himself Chad. He said his location was in the Bakersfield region, east of San Luis Obispo, and he was able to get up close and take this photograph under this tail, which leads to something quite fascinating. Then, 10 days later, on May 16, 2007, a man calling himself Rajman 1977 said that he was with his family having lunch in Capitola, northwest of San Luis Obispo, when he saw this approach of this and started taking pictures. And this was the closest he got. And you will also see, I don't know if it's clear in here, but the same <clears throat> kind of symbols on ch the Chad are also on Rajman. Then, 
June 5th. I received more photographs by hard mail, 12 glossy print photos from a Ty Brannigan who said that he was on his bicycle with a group and they were bicycling through Big Basin Redwood State Park in California and that this object came in flickering in and out, flickering in and out, and that they were so stunned the first time that nobody even thought about getting their camera before it disappeared. Then it came back a second and a third time, and he was determined, he got his camera out of his backpack, he hung it onto his wrist, hoping that it would come back, and it did, and these are his photos. This is Chad for comparison. Now, these dragonfly drone photographs, I am sure you've all heard this, they were attacked as being CGI and Photoshop productions for an upcoming electronic game and or movie that proved to be completely untrue and supports the perception that modern counterintelligence now uses that phony CGI Photoshop cover-up in this digital web age as they used weather balloons and swamp gas 60 years ago. In fact, Steve Winans from Kansas MUFON sent me a 14-page analysis about color fringing evidence in the dragonfly drone photos. Color fringing occurs when a lens fails to focus all the colors to the same convergence point. And it occurs because lenses have different refraction indexes for different wavelengths of light. And Steve concluded, quote, the color fringing that is present in almost all the images of the dragonfly drones that people have submitted to earthfiles.com, including the 12 prints from Ty Brannigan and Big Basin mailed to Linda Moulton Howe, is a strong indication that these images were produced by a camera and not computer software. The simplest explanation is that these images are of an actual but unknown object in the sky, close quote, Steve Winan, Kansas MUFON. I and others were intrigued by the fact that we are also now seeing symbols on these boxes. We've seen them on the tail, now we're seeing them on these boxes. And this is as close as I can get, but I want to show you so that you can see this pattern isolated on the box of this large drone in Big Basin. Now, earlier in the May, that was June, May, when Chad was photographing and he tried to get a close-up, and this is as close as he could get, well, on Saturday, June 17, 2007, I received this photo with the tail flipped, and it came from a truck driver in Shermandale, Pennsylvania. He emailed me and said, I'm studying your Earth Files website of those Chad photographs, and I rotated the drone tail 180 degrees to see if I could see the numbers and symbols more clearly. And he decided that right here, and repeated, that he was seeing plus X space YX7 Plus. He Googled it, and this is what came up for him. This PDS, that is an acronym that stands for Planetary Data System. And look what is down here. Starbase.jpl.nasa.gov. So, I Googled. Here is Linda. This is what comes up for me. Mission name, deep space program, science experiment, spacecraft name, Clementine 1, producer institution name, Naval Research Laboratory. And then, if you Google deep space program science experiment, there is information about the Clementine 1 lunar mapping mission operated by the Naval Research Laboratory that launched January 25, 1994 from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California as a joint ballistic missile defense organization and NASA lunar photographing effort. Clementine photographed the front, the back, and the poles of the moon showing the smoother backside. 
here you can see left is the front right is the back I can't see very well at all up here but I'm very curious how many of you have seen Clementine back of the moon photographs since this mission exactly our taxpayer dollars paid for this incredible mission. It was supposed to also go and photograph Geographos, a Latin name for an asteroid out there of a very bizarre spindle shape. And what did we hear on television news? That something had happened that was inexplicable to the Clementine mission and they couldn't go to the asteroid. Frankly, I think they went to the asteroid. I think they've got photos. I think they know it's something artificial. And we are not told like we are not told so much. Now remember that this research started from studying the symbols on the dragonfly drone tails. When I googled starbase jplnasa.gov, I was taken to a long index of Clementine files. And there, back in that year of 2007, I was able to go URL, URL, and I came to dozens of photographs on the moon. Within two days of my having done that search, and that means the truck driver was probably doing the same thing, you got those cards, website removed. The dragonfly drone mystery deepened with an email on June 26, 2007 from a man describing himself as a scientist and computer software expert who had worked from 1984 to 1987 for a Defense Department funded laboratory in Palo Alto, California. Quote, I am using the alias Isaac and used to work in what was called the CARAT, all caps, acronym, program in the 1980s. During my time there, I worked with a lot of the technology that is clearly at work in the recent drone strange craft sightings, most notably the language and diagrams seen on the underside of each craft. Isaac explained that he had spent years writing code and designing both analog and digital circuits a process that at least visually resembled the mysterious and complex carrot diagrams that he was asked to study and reproduce. Here is extraterrestrial software technology that is done in an infinitely intricate, complex diagram. He said, I am very familiar with the language on the undersides of the dragonfly drones seen clearly in photos by Chad and Rajman, and in another form in the big basin photos. One question that I can answer for sure is why they are suddenly here. These craft have probably existed in their current form for decades, and I can say for sure that the technology behind them has existed for decades before that. He means centuries. The language, in fact, was the subject of my work in years past. The reason that they are suddenly visible, however, is another matter entirely. These craft, assuming that they're anything like the hardware that I worked with in the 1980s, and assuming that they're better, are equipped with technology that enables invisibility. That invisibility can be controlled both on board the craft and remotely. However, what's important in this case is that this invisibility can also be disrupted by other technology. Think of it like radar jamming, close quote. They flicker in and out. I'm especially sure of this in the case of the Big Basin sightings because of the way the witness described one of the appearances being only a momentary flicker, which is consistent with the unintentional intermittent triggering of such a jamming device, and the implication is our government jamming to see them in the sky. 
Here I have taken one of the black and white extraterrestrial diagrams that Isaac sent, and I just wanted you to get a flavor for what it is like to go through and study this extraterrestrial software here. And these are matches of what are on these diagrams in the bottom of this tail. And there are other matches, but you have to use tracing paper. And as soon as you begin using tracing paper over these symbols, you will see that one that you thought was identical is not. The angle is off, a tiny dot, a short little line. They are infinitely complex. Here is another example of what we're talking about, and you will recognize this is a symbol on the drones. And here is another. Carrot, commercial applications research for extraterrestrial technology. No beating around the bush here. Q486 research report, December 1986, Palo Alto, California. A blacked out line and Packel staff. There's a symbol of a circle around the top of a triangle with the initials Packel, which means Palo Alto, Carrot Laboratory, and the bottom address line blacked out. I received two professional confidential communications after my first broadcast in Earth Files about this. And they said, you can't use my email, you can't use my name, but I want you to know I worked in Palo Alto in the 1980s and I know about this program and I know that what has been released is real. The first paragraph of the carrot document begins as an overview. This is a complex document, so I am only going to read a few highlighted excerpts beginning with this first paragraph that says, quote, the goal of this research has been achieving a greater understanding of extraterrestrial technology within the context of commercial applications and civilian use. The process of converting raw artifacts of extraterrestrial origin to usable, fully documented human technology is termed extraction." Close quote. There was no confusion for Isaac and the 199 other scientists working underground. He explained to me in a private email, the building in Palo Alto would have looked like a library. Two stories, brick, trees, grass a very nice counterintelligence cover for a very vast laboratory underground. He said, what was especially amusing about this whole affair was the way that our military management almost tried to act as if the technology we were essentially reverse engineering was not extraterrestrial. Aside from the word extraterrestrial itself, we rarely heard any other terms like alien or UFO or outer space or anything. These aspects were only mentioned briefly when absolutely necessary to explain something. In many cases, it was necessary, please listen to this sentence, it was necessary to differentiate between the different extraterrestrial races and their respective technologies and our military handlers didn't even use the word races. The extraterrestrials were referred to simply as different sources." Close quote. Technology identified as extraterrestrial in a huge lab underground at Palo Alto from different extraterrestrial races. Q486 focused on four key subjects, all of which were based on artifacts of extraterrestrial origin ob obtained from crash site recovery operations conducted during the last two decades. That would have been 1966 to 1986. 
They're dealing with recent crash retrievals that none of us know anything about. Or the landing or the putting down in a gift form from extraterrestrials technology that we have been able to use, but 66 to 86. How many have heard about us retrieving extraterrestrial technology in those 20 year periods? And it's supposed to have all come from within the continental boundaries of the United States. And the ET technology is identified as, quote, personal anti-gravity generator, so named because it is small and portable. It means you could point at something and lift a stone if it were 10 tons. Three-dimensional image recorder projector. A complex system of symbols and geometric constructs capable of both defining the functionality of certain artifacts as well as manipulating their behavior crudely analogous to a computer programming language but without the need for a compilation or interpretation phase. The next paragraph is blacked out followed by anti-gravity technologies are among the most ubiquitous recovered from extraterrestrial craft. While anti-gravity is most commonly associated with propulsion, the principles underlying the technology of anti-gravity extend into a far broader domain. Indeed, virtually all aspects of most extraterrestrial craft seem to incorporate this use in some way, close quote. Anti-gravity technology could explain how Gobekli Tepe was made and buried so long ago. Perhaps most startling is the fact that the very components within a given extraterrestrial craft appear to be held in place in relation to one another exclusively by anti-gravitational means. This is a partial explanation for the commonly noted lack of rivets and adhesives in the construction of these craft, close quote. Here is a photograph of the anti-gravity at work the cylindrical ET machine here is generating an anti-gravity force to these I-beams that are raised. It was taken, I think, deliberately on one of these light boxes so that there is not a lot of depth, but these are actually suspended. This is causing the suspension and the trick, the mystery, the unidentified ingredient. What? is the frequency of the field, what generates the field, how is it that the field can be generated on the earth that will make the self-activating software run machines here without the prime intelligence having to be involved. It is the issue of fields and frequencies and resonances that is a key. And this is where the stone circles, the pyramids, and a place like Gobekli Tepe may have been built to help interact with the generation of those fields. Here is another just to show you that on this anti-gravity 3D hologram projector, creation of invisibility, and a million other things that this can do in the field here are the matching symbols here. Now, the ET diagram of self-activating software leaked by Isaac is based on a language of numbers in a complex matrix behind the diagrams. And that same type of circles and spirals appeared in a barley formation at Windmill Hill near Avebury, Truslow, England on May 25th, 2009. And then there is this extraordinary 300 foot diameter pattern discovered in a barley field at Barbary Castle in Wiltshire on June 1st, 2008. There had been rain the day before and all night long and the ground was muddy UK crop formation investigator Charles Mallet said he walked about 200 meters to reach this pattern and he had mud all over his boots, his jeans, up to his knees. But when he reached this barley pattern, quote, it was perfectly clean, no mud, no one had walked 
on that fragile young barley. Retired astrophysicist Mike Reed from the University of Arizona was studying this crop formation in an aerial photo that I had at earthfiles.com. And he realized with shock that he was looking at a mathematical graphic for pi out to nine decimal places. Here. And he called me. He called, I remember the night, he called and he said, Linda Howe, I am looking at your website. I cannot believe what I think I have discovered. And he explained that in the use of pi, he made telescopes his entire career. He was using pi every single day of his professional life. And pi is the Greek symbol for the ratio of any circle's circumference to its diameter in Euclidean geometry, which is equal to 3.14 and beyond infinitely, because pi is an irrational number in which the decimal expansion never ends and it does not repeat. Mike Reed told me, quote, the thing that struck me was the little dot right here. Those yellow lines he superimposed to make his point of his discovery. When you go back, this is what he's looking at. So here's the dot. These are the lines that are in the barley and the circles. So he did this to explain that he did as an experiment to his hunch, he took the measurement of this arc up to here, the 90 degrees, and said this is the shortest angle here, and one here. So he took this size, and he divided a 360 degree circle, and superimposed that on the pattern. And when you start and his hunch is that the little circle is a decimal. When you have done the superimposition and you count backwards, one, two, three, you're at the beginning. This is the beginning of this. One, two, three, decimal point, 90 degree ratchet, one. 90 degree ratchet, one, two, three, four. 90 degree ratchet, one, 90 degree ratchet, one, two, three, four, five. You can continue to do that. And Mike said in all of his years making telescopes, working with pi, he said the idea that you could take a horizontal surface and take a number like pi and use concentric circles that would have 90 degree divisions that would divide that number had never occurred to him. But where have we seen this today? There it is. There is exactly the concept defined in extraterrestrial self-activating software this is the crop formation. This is the carrot document. This is the extraterrestrial software to create self-activating technology. Isaac wrote, their ET technology is different in that it did not operate like magical, it, it did operate like a magical piece of paper sitting on a table, meaning it could do work all by itself because it was programmed and could be activated in a field. They had something akin to a language that could quite literally execute itself, at least in the presence of this very special field. The language is a system of symbols along with geometric forms and patterns that fit together to form diagrams that are themselves functional. Once they are drawn on a suitable surface made of a suitable material and in the presence of a certain type of field, they immediately begin performing the desired tasks. It really did seem like magic to us. I worked with these symbols more than anything during my time at the Palo Alto Carrot Lab, and I recognized them the moment I saw them in the dragonfly drone photos. 
Word was that the extraterrestrials could design these diagrams as quickly and easily as a human programmer could write a Fortran program. It is humble to think that even a network of supercomputers was not able to duplicate what the ETs could do in their own heads, close quote. Even this July 17, 1991 wheat pattern at Barbary Castle that emerged 17 years before the Pi formation at Barbary Castle, in both were the same ratcheted. And we had not a clue back then. Here it is, the same pattern. This is the pattern that ended up in Mathematica. It ended up in mathematical journals. It was described by Gerald Hawkins, the astronomer and author of Stonehenge Decoded, that he had found five or six geometric theorems inside of this pattern that did not exist in Euclid, did not exist in any university geometry text. And he challenged mathematicians to come up with those geometric patterns, and none of them could. And a $5,000 prize that he had out there for anybody who could come up with what was embedded in this crop formation went uncollected. Dr. Hawkins and I also talked about a 1992 experience that I had in a Wiltshire County, England crop formation where I met a man who told me that he had firsthand information that the American Central Intelligence Agency was trying to photograph from satellites every crop formation in chronological sequence so that computers could look for mathematical patterns that might be decoded. And then the man startled me by explaining that the CIA's theory was that we are dealing with time travelers and the crop formations were providing something like a complex monitoring technology to gauge the effectiveness of the time traveler's efforts. But why, he had no answer. Alien symbols and time travel also emerged in December 1980 at the RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge Air Force Base in Suffolk County, England. Strange moving aerial lights, beams, and at least one craft interacted with several military personnel over a 72-hour period from midnight December 26th unto sunup December 28, 1980. At the time, the joint UK and US RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge was NATO's largest air base in Europe and there were highly classified nuclear weapons in some of the weapon storage areas. Now we know there were nuclear weapons on both sides. Woodbridge had secret nuclear weapons and Bentwaters had secret nuclear weapons. After midnight on December 26th, Staff Sergeant James Penniston in Charlie Flight Security was called to the Woodbridge East Gate. There he met with men who were reporting these strange colorful lights in the Rendlesham Forest that ran along the Woodbridge airfield. Sergeant Penniston learned from Central Security Control that unidentified aerial objects had been tracked on radar going right down and into Rendlesham Forest. So he decided that he had to go into the civilian forest to find out what was happening. Two young airmen went with him, John Burroughs, and Ed Kavansak. As the men followed the lights eastward, their radios filled with static and they lost contact with central security control for about 45 minutes. And those were 45 minutes of missing time to Jim Penniston, John Burroughs, and Ed Kavansak. During that time, none of the three men remember the same details. But John Burroughs and Jim Penniston both remember running after lights that moved so rapidly through the dense tree growth they could not understand how anything entirely matter could do that. Jim Penniston says that he watched a bright white light transform into a solid black glassy surface craft on the forest ground. And what did it have in the front? Symbols raised on the surface like braille, and Jim Penniston dragged his fingers along the tops of the symbols, 
being aware that everything felt much warmer than the cold December air around him. And as he dragged his fingers, his brain, his mind was filled with zeros and ones. But he never told a single soul, including John Burroughs, until John Burroughs, Jim Penniston, and I, with Prometheus Productions out of Los Angeles, were in Phoenix, Arizona, doing an Ancient Aliens production three years ago. And it was the very first time, right there, with TV cameras all around us, he said, would you all like to see the notebook that I wrote in on December 26th? And when he pulled it out, John was standing there, and his face looked shocked. Because Penniston was turning to the back, it did not look fresh, it looked old. And here were these pages of zeros and ones. Jim knew that one month after that he was ordered by his superiors to go to an office where there was NSA, there were British intel, and they ordered him to do a chemical hypnosis. On his watch, he was under for three hours. He's worried his whole life since. What did they do to my brain? Did they change something? What did they access? Why can't I remember? And he went to do hypnosis. And in 1994, here are brief excerpts from what came out of that hypnosis of a man's mind that feels extremely frustrated to want to understand what happened to them on December 26th after midnight in Rendlesham Forest. And here are three short excerpts. The mission is contact. Do they say contact with what? Us, purpose, research, for, to help them. To help them with what? Themselves. They are time travelers. They are us. You touch the symbols and you set off a program? Yes, the craft was repairing itself. That's self-activating software. All they wanted was a place to stay while it repaired itself. And by touching the symbols, you disrupted the repair program. I activated a binary code. The two government men want to know why. They ask me if I ever had any other encounters with the lights and time travelers before. I haven't. Are they using us something like breeding stock? No, like band-aids. Do they ever take fetuses? If it is task, they do. There are different ships for tasking. The government agents know about this. That's why they want to contain the situation. They see you as requiring damage control. Yes, they see me and John Burroughs, and they're worried about Colonel Halt. They know all about it. They're going to give me a warning. They tell me that I will hurt the world. It will breach national security and can destroy the system, cause wars, chaos in the streets. That's why it is important to keep it quiet. But it doesn't make any difference if I talk about the story because it is too unbelievable. Taking chromosomes to use as band-aids in a far distant future where something is terribly wrong and another civilization is fighting to survive. Are they coming back here because we are them, as Jim Penniston says? Are they coming back to the 20th and 21st centuries because this was the last time on Earth that healthier DNA was worth harvesting? Is all the genetic material that has been harvested from Earth animals and humans for at least a century 
providing the band-aids. Would humanity today change its self-destructive ways if it knew for a fact that our current DNA was being harvested by self-activating machines in the UFO phenomena to be used to keep a distant version of humanity alive in a future timeline, or another dimension, or even another universe where DNA no longer replicates. I think it is likely that Gobekli Tepe was built by intelligent beings from somewhere else in the cosmos that had lived on Earth where long ago they constructed pillars and pyramids, stone circles and ziggurats as machinery for energy and communication and probably for purposes incomprehensible to us. And that Homo sapien is also another ET construction from genetic manipulation of already evolving primates. How ironic a SETI listens to radio signals in space for evidence of other life in the universe, that archaeologists are digging into the earth and finding structures that could be the residue of ancient terraforming by alien minds with their self-activating software and machines. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>